hopefully in this video you learn a few things about meiosis. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of what meiosis is, I uh, want to talk a little bit about DNA and the different forms of DNA. DNA in its natural state in a normal cell is called chromatin. Notice an N at the end, chromatin. Chromatin kind of looks like spaghetti noodles. It's all strung out, uncondensed, unfoiled, uh, uncoiled DNA. So that's chromatin. Looks like spaghetti noodles. That's the normal state of DNA. DNA will then condense into what we call chromosomes. Chromosomes is an X-like structure. So it's DNA that's highly condensed that has this X-like structure. And more importantly, if I'm really doing it well, it's more like this. It still kind of looks like an X, but there's two. Th there's definitely two halves to it, and one of those halves of DNA is a chromatid. Chromatid with a D. So half of that chromosome is a chromatid. The last thing that we need to know before we can go on is this term, a tetrad. A tetrad is two homologous or two of the same chromosomes connected together like this that we see here. So there's two of the same chromosomes stacked on top of each other. So now that we've got the vocab out of the way, let's get going. So a normal human cell has 46 chromosomes total. 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Just like if you had 23 pairs of shoes, that would be a total of 46 shoes. So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes total. So that is the diploid number. Diploid or di meaning two. So diploid is two copies of each chromosome. The signal or symbol for that is n is equal to the number of chromosomes, so two of each chromosome, diploid, two copies of each chromosome. So here would be a picture of an individual's uh, chromosomes, and obviously this would be a normal cell because you have two copies of each chromosome, two copies of one, two copies of two, so on and so forth, two copies of chromosome nine, two copies of chromosome 17, 21, etc., etc. So where does our DNA come from? Well, from our biological parents, of course. And when I say things like mom and dad, I'm referring to the biological mother and the biological father. So do, but here's the thing. Do sperm and egg cells have two sets of chromosomes like the rest of all the cells in our body? Because we just said all the cells in our body have two sets of chromosomes. So do sperm and egg cells have all of those sets of chromosomes as well? Or do they have one set of chromosomes? Well, let's, let's, let's sort this out a little bit. So here's an egg with 46 chromosomes and a sperm with 46 chromosomes. Well, if that made a zygote, we said all of our cells need to have 46 chromosomes. Well, 46 plus 46 is 92. That doesn't work. So we need something else going on here to help us out so we don't have this problem right here of 92 chromosomes in a zygote or in a developing offspring. Because if that was the case, we'd have a chromosomal abnormality. Chromosomal abnormalities are bad because usually if there's an extra chromosome or extra DNA, usually that's going to cause a fatal flaw in development. So the zygote would never develop if usually if there's chromosomal abnormalities. So somehow we have to fix this solution. The egg and the sperm can't have the same number of chromosomes in it as our normal cells. So how do we make the sperm and eggs? We got to reduce 46 chromosomes to 23 chromosomes. In other words, we got to divide the number of chromosomes in half, and or we need to make haploid cells. So instead of having diploid cells, we got to take diploid cells and make haploid cells. 
where there's only one copy of each chromosome, right? You get half of your DNA from your mom and half of your DNA from dad. Well, in order to get half from mom and half from dad, part of this process is going from diploid to haploid. So we take 46 chromosomes from the egg and the sperm, or sorry, from a normal cell in the male, normal, normal cell in the male, normal cell in the female, and we go through a process to half this number to 23 and 23 to make our gametes or our haploid cells. These are our sex cells. That process to do that is called meiosis. So then when those egg and sperm come together, each with 23 chromosomes or each with half the number, that's fertilization, we get our normal number for our zygote of 46 cells. That will develop perfectly because that's the number that we're supposed to have in the first place. Another quick term for us here is homologous chromosomes. And that picture of all the chromosomes that I showed you before, um, we saw two copies of chromosome number one and two copies of chromosome number two, so on and so forth. Well, both of these copies are homologous chromosomes because this is chromosome number one and this is chromosome number one. Same thing with these guys here. This is a copy of chromosome number two. This is a copy of chromosome number two. So both of these are homologous chromosomes. Now, we also know that these chromosomes have different genes on them or segments of DNA that's going to code for a protein. So if the blue chromosome and the red chromosome are both homologous chromosomes, they both can chain the eye color gene. But we all know those genes are different. And when we say that, it's kind of a it's kind of a, a raw, not entirely right thing to say because it's not really genes, but it's the alleles because brown eyes and blue eyes are both eye colors, but the different there's different DNA sequences at those genes. So the different sequences of DNA for our different traits for the same gene, in this case, eye color, those are different alleles for the same gene. So there's a brown I'd allele and the blue I'd allele. So two, two terms there, homologous chromosomes and alleles. Meiosis happens in two basic steps. The first step is we're going to have a cell that's going to start off everything and we go through DNA replication first. We go through all the phases, the DNA lines up, and then we divide. Once we divide all of the different chromosomes, here you see one copy of the blue chromosome, one copy of the red chromosome. So this cell right here would be 1N or haploid. Same with here, one of each chromosome, so that cell is haploid as well. So we start off with two copies of each chromosome, in other words, a diploid cell. And by the end of meiosis one, the first part of meiosis, we're left with two haploid or 1N cells. In other words, we have one copy of each chromosome in each of the two cells that we make. And then the second part of meiosis, we're going to take those two cells that we had before, we're going to line up the DNA just like we did before, and now we're going to split apart the chromosomes into chromatids. So we start out with one copy of each chromosome, it's haploid, and we still have one copy of each chromosome represented in each cell, and it's still haploid. We have the division again, so now we're left with four haploid gametes. Four haploid gametes, gametes being the sex cells. So these would develop into sperm cells or potentially egg cells, depending on if it was male or female. In meiosis, we have meiosis 1 and we have meiosis 2. Both each have their own prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So the whole thing starts off in prophase 1. The characteristics of prophase 1 is the DNA is condensing from that strung out spaghetti-like looking stuff that we call chromatin, and it's condensing into chromosomes the X, and then eventually we'll make tetrads, which is the two chromosomes 
two homologous chromosomes that are stacked on top of each other. The nucleus of the cell starts to dissolve or break down, and then crossover can happen. So what crossover is, and let's say that we have two of the same chromosome. So we're going to say that the red chromosome and the green chromosome are homologous chromosomes. If this part right here on the green chromosome and this part right here on the red chromosome, and again these are homologous or the same chromosomes, if those were to switch places, that's crossover. So what it would look like would be the green chromosome, when everything's said and done, would look something like that, and the red chromosome would look like that. So that those parts of the same chromosome that have the same genes on them would switch places. So prophase one, crossover can happen. The chromatin condenses, the DNA condenses from the chromatin to chromosomes, and then those chromosomes stack on top of each other, and the nucleus starts to dissolve. The next phase is metaphase one. Now, all those homologous chromosomes that are now stacked up as tetrads align in the middle of the cell. So metaphase, the DNA lines up in the middle. Metaphase middle. You also see these guys in here called spindle fibers. The spindle fibers are going to attach to those tetrads as well. The next phase is anaphase 1. So now, in anaphase 1, the spindle fibers are going to pull apart those tetrads. So we have those tetrads. Now we're going to pull from the spindle fibers and pull from the spindle fibers. So now we have a chromosome getting pulled in that direction and a chromosome getting pulled in that direction. So we're going from tetrads to chromosomes. But it's still in the same cell, so this cell is still diploid because there's still two copies of each chromosome. Then there's telophase 1. Telophase 1 starts with the cell starting to pinch on itself. See how you see this cell starts to indent on itself right there? This cell is definitely still diploid because it's still all under the same roof. And you have one copy of each, or sorry, two copies of each chromosome still under the same roof. At the end of telophase two, we have two different cells, two different cells. Each one is a haploid cell because there's one copy of this chromosome and one copy of this chromosome in this cell, and this cell only has one copy of each chromosome. From the end of telophase one comes prophase two. Prophase two is almost identical to the end of telophase one. So it, there's still two haploid cells. Chromosomes is the form in the DNA. And as I mentioned before, it's extremely similar to the end of telophase 1. After prophase 2 becomes metaphase 2. So now the chromosomes line up in the middle. Again, metaphase middle. But now instead of tetrads, we have chromosomes. So each cell has chromosomes lined up in the middle of the cell. Next is anaphase 2 where now our spindle fibers pull apart the chromosomes into chromatids. So we had this chromosome, spindle fibers are pulling, so what we're left with is a chromatid here getting pulled in that direction and a chromatid there getting pulled in that direction. So we have two cells and now the form of the DNA is chromatids. Last part of meiosis is telophase two. It starts when the cell is starting to pinch down on itself. Again, we can see those pinches starting to happen. Telophase two ends with four haploid cells. So all of these cells are still haploid or one N. Each is a gamete with one allele per gene. So again, if we're using that eye color, maybe this one has a brown hair allele, or brown eyes, excuse me, and this is blue eyes, and this one is blue eyes as well, and maybe that one's brown. So four haploid daughter cells are formed, each having only one chromosome represented and one allele per gene. In summary, 
meiosis starts out with a diploid, ooh, with a diploid cell. DNA replicates, and then we have a division. So now we have haploid cells. We'll have another division, so we're left with four haploid gametes. These are all still 1N. Remember your PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And that is all she wrote for the basics of meiosis. It's like this and like that and like this, Anna. It's like that and like this and like that, Anna. It's like this. So just chill to the next episode.